but I will mainly discuss these three samples throughout my talk. Cobalt titanium on P25, which is just shown here, with a certain loading and loading on the manganese. And we do the manganese loading in two ways, or we do it after the homogeneous deposition precipitation of the cobalt via impregnation, or we do them both together in one single step. Now, X-ray diffraction, in a calcined way, you can see that you have the formation of cobalt oxide particles for these first two preparations of these two uh, first catalysts. But this, the third one, where we have the mixing right away, we see a cobalt manganese oxide form. And here you also see the estimation of the size. Now what are these catalysts doing uh, in a catalytic reactor? Well, the first thing what we have to underline is that we are doing reactions with an hydrogen CO ratio of 2 and around two, uh, 220 degrees C in one bar. So it's not yet realistic conditions. We have about CO conversions of around 3%, stable activity over 40 hours. And we reduce the catalyst before we uh, start the reaction, first in hydrogen at 350 degrees C. Now here I show you some results. Uh, the first thing what I would like to uh, discuss is the alpha, the chain growth probability. And when you add manganese, you see that the alpha value is increasing, and especially, for example, for this mixed metal system. Now when you look to the cobalt time yield, you see that these two catalysts, they are not that different, but this one is really dropped in activity. I will come and explain this later on. All things what we notice is that when you uh, look into the methane formation and the C5 plus selectivity, that when you increase, the, or you add manganese to it, that the methane conversion will drop, C5 plus uh, uh, selectivity will increase. So you have a decrease in hydrogenation rate, an increase in alpha and off in selectivity as is plotted here. So when you have manganese around, less methane, more orphans, more C5+. Plus. Now this was for the different preparation routes. We also have then varied the amount of manganese and this uh, kind of plot summarizes the results. As I already said, less methane, more C5+, plus, when you add more manganese to the system and you have a kind of optimal yield when you have intermediate manganese cobalt ratios. Now when you analyze these samples with hydrogen sorption, you'll find that the samples here, they absorb the most hydrogen. And when you look into um, the, the temp pictures, I also would like to underline that after, reaction, after reduction, we have uh, samples which have about 6 to 8 nanometers cobalt particles. But this shows the general trend, and now the question is, what is now manganese on a physical chemical basis doing with the cobalt? For this we have employed a lot of characterization tools, and I cannot dwell on all of them, but I will explain more, in, more or less in detail these five. I will talk about temperature program reduction, XPS, soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy, TEM yields and some exhausts, and drift, infrared, Fourier transform, after CO absorption, during CO hydrogenation. So the TPR results are as follows. Here you see the, uh, the, the, uh, so the signal as function of temperature during ramping. You have more or less three of these peaks, and they are coinciding with to a two-step reduction where you have cobalt, co cobalt 3 or 4 to cobalt oxygen, cobalt oxygen to cobalt metal. Now this mixed system where cobalt and manganese is added in one step has a peculiar behavior, totally different reduction behavior, and that's of course because you have your manganese cobalt oxide which has then to disrupt into a manganese oxide in cobalt metal. Now is this in line with what you would expect then in the XPS? Well, after uh, calcination. This is a cobalt 3 or 4 reference. Then this is the cobalt titania, cobalt manganese titania, and this is that special preparation group. But what you find is that the cobalt titania, the cobalt manganese titania, you see clearly cobalt 3 or 4, and here you see that you have a different phase form on the catalyst. Now, what are after reduction? The cobalt titania makes cobalt metal. Cobalt manganese titania at this loading makes 
a lot of metal, but some oxide as well. And this one is clearly not yet reduced at this temperature. So it's much more difficult to reduce if you add manganese in too large amount, but also if you add manganese in, this high, uh, in that uh, co-precipitated way. Now, this is fine, but XPS looks is a surface technique, but can we now have additional uh, proof for what is happening on the surface? For this, we worked together with a group of Schlögel in Berlin, and we have performed experiments at Bessie where we use soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy in an in situ cell. And the difference with classical um, X-ray absorption studies is that you now measure the L edge, and that allows you to more measure the cobalt and manganese oxidation during the reduction. It's uh, in a total electron yield mode and it's very surface sensitive. So it means that you will see the upper layer during this uh, reduction. Now the manganese, if you uh, follow the manganese L edges, these are some reference oxides. And, and you have here after calcination the red curve and here after uh, the reduction, then this curve coincides very well with that one. And this is manganese oxide. So manganese starting as a different phase in a higher oxidation state goes to the manganese ox uh, single oxide and the cobalt mainly goes to cobalt metal. But when we look to what at the surface is happening under these in situ conditions, well, can we then probe what is the oxidation state in the presence of the manganese? But for this we first used the reference compound, cobalt 3 or 4, and we did a reduction treatment in that in situ cell at the beam line. You see that we have then reference spectra of cobalt 3 or 4. You can actually calculate them also. Cobalt 3 or 4, cobalt oxygen, cobalt metal. Because we have now these reference spectra, you can do a kind of linear combination and calculate them during a reduction in a real cobalt manganese titanium catalyst. And the res results are shown here. Well, this is for the oxide, as I already showed. This is valence 2.5. Then you reduce it, you make valence 2 cobalt oxygen, cobalt oxide. And then you go to cobalt metal. Now, at the surface, seemingly, the manganese prevents the cobalt to be completely reduced. And here in this table, I plot the percentage of cobalt oxygen in the case of cobalt manganese titania and compare it with the cobalt titania catalyst. And clearly you have a higher fraction of cobalt oxygen after reduction in this in situ cell than in the cobalt titanium. So somehow the manganese is in close contact with the cobalt and, and by doing this it's able to control its reduction behavior. Now this tells you something about how, what is the oxidation state or the surface uh, structure of the catalyst. Can we tell something about where the manganese and the cobalt are located? And here I show you and uh, 10 eels, this electron uh, microscopy with energy electron loss spectroscopy, where you have, again, spectra, for example, the manganese and the cobalt, which allows you to make line scans and then quantify these particles, what the composition is. And for example, well, this is our false colors. Green is titania, red is cobalt, and these purple blue are the uh, manganese. So you see that manganese is also a bit on the titania, but also near the cobalt particle. But this is for the calcite case, I would like to underline this. If you make then this line scan, you see that cobalt and manganese are always close by. So what happens after reduction? Well, after reduction, this cobalt manganese particle, this cobalt oxygen particle, it breaks up and you see that the cobalt reduces to cobalt metal, and always you have somehow nearby a manganese phase. Now it's very interesting to recall the hydrogen sorption experiments. I said that at a certain level of manganese promotion, we have an increased amount of hydrogen sorption. When you have too much uh, manganese on the catalyst, the hydrogen sorption will be suppressed. Now what happens, in our, our opinion, is that because manganese is nearby and also partially located on the titania, it prevents that the titania will come on the, co the, the cobalt particle. So it suppresses the strong metal support interaction by having a good interaction with the cobalt particle. 
And so that means that if you would not have this manganese, the titania, we can even prove with XPS that you have indeed reduction to titania 3 plus, which we then assume would, uh, will come onto the titania. If you have too much manganese, then you're also covering, decorating the surface of the cobalt, and therefore you will decrease the hydrogen absorption as well. Now this is a kind of summary. You have manganese cobalt and cobalt 304 this is after calcination, and some manganese oxide on the support. You reduce this, or you do the uh, CO hydrogen reaction, and then you will have cobalt with nearby manganese, but also you will form manganese titanate. Now, this kind of structure we were able to prove also with XL spectroscopy. Now, this is all fine. We have been able to show what it, where the manganese is located, how the manganese looks like, and how the cobalt looks like, and also that they feel each other in the sense that they affect reduction. What does that happen with, for example, when you absorb CO on this kind of catalyst? Well, it's a kind of busy slide where I have plotted the different catalysts, cobalt, and the different amounts of manganese. You see if the manganese here increases, it means that you have more manganese on the catalyst. And we have to start with that black curve. Now, this is gas phase CO. I will not consider it further. But here you see a broadband, rather broadband, which is at least bridged, but more probably even more than only that. And also you see this band here, which is the linear CO on the call. Now if you add more and more manganese on it, you will see that this band is vanishing, and actually you also will see some shifts in this linear CO. You also will see sometimes, in this case, for example, clearly, you see bands even here, which we believe, but we are not yet sure, is uh, CO uh, absorbed maybe to some cobalt manganese type uh, uh, cluster. Now, what I want to show with this is that the more manganese is in the catalyst, the less the, 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 um, the linear to bridge ratio will increase. If we compare it with, for example, work which has been done on platinum or rhodium catalysts, but also linear to bridge CO ratios have been determined as a function of promoter's elements, we can explain it as follows. Manganese is a kind of Lewis uh, acid cation, which has a certain parameter, a Kamla Tuft parameter, which is around 4.2. And what we believe is because of that value, that it will uh, uh, um, withdraw electron density of the cobalt. Because of that, there's less back donation to the CO, and therefore you will see less bridged and also some shifts in the CO frequency. This is shown here, linear to bridge ratio, and that coincides with more C5+. Plus. So to summarize this, overall CO absorption decreases, I forgot to say it, but seemingly the overall CO absorption decreases, and the linear to bridge CO ratio increases the function of the manganese loading. We also have applied in, uh, the drift approach, uh, infrared approach, uh, uh, during reaction, so CO hydrogenation. But I will not consider the, the CH uh, stretching uh, region, where you can see buildup of uh, hydrocarbons, but it's very complex, and therefore I will not consider it in this talk. But uh, the CO, you see CO, but you only see linear CO. You see no bridge CO at all. And you also what you see is the same trend as we, I already explained for when you just have only CO, is that you see a shift when you have more manganese on the catalyst, which is in line with that donation, electron donation withdrawal effect, which I already explained. So with this, I come to my uh, conclusions. And I would like to then come back to my first slides when I considered the different types of promotions. So I said something about structural promotion, electronic promotion, and also synergistic promotion. So what do we know now after one PhD on this system about this promotion effect? Well, the first thing is that we feel, believe that manganese is somehow uh, helping the particle, the cobalt particle, to keep a certain size, certain particle size, and also prevents because it's decorating not only the cobalt particle, but also somehow the titania, the titania will move onto the cobalt. And so keeping it stable. If you have too much of the manganese, 
you're just decorating so much the cobble and therefore you will lose active metal surface and therefore also you, use, uh, you will uh, decrease your activity. Well, the decoration has another effect. I already explained that you feel cobalt and manganese, they feel each other, and we can prove that uh, spectroscopically. And also you can see that in the infrared by the adsorption of CO. And I already explained that the manganese seemingly also has an influence on the electronic properties of the cobalt. Now a final effect which I did not discuss is the synergistic promotion effects of, uh, of manganese. Now one uh, uh, observation which supports that it has uh, uh, it is, has some activities in water gas shift reactions when you look into the drift spectra in the carbonate region. Where you see when you have more and more manganese you will see also more of the carbonate built up at the catalyst surface. And actually it's not so, uh, really wondering if you look into the literature where manganese oxides are reported to be active in this reaction. So I've shown you now that we have these three things, so three, these three roles of manganese, we still have to substantiate what the exact role was on the molecular level, but I hope I have convinced you that it is an intriguing material and that with an advanced spectroscopic, microscopic tools, you can shed much more insight into what is going on in these kinds of reaction systems. This is of course teamwork, first of all I would like to thank Shell Global Solution for financial support, Emil de Smit who did uh, the work of the infrared and is currently a PG working again for Shell but now on iron. These are all the people in the group who have worked on this topic. We have to think, uh, thank uh, Odile Stefan from uh, Orsay, France for the STEM yields. Shell, Heiko Osterbeek, Hermann Kerbers and Karl Messers. And uh, these synchrotrons for all the available beam time to make these measurements possible. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and then, then, yeah, we explain it as the CO, which is maybe bridge bonded, is maybe weaker bonded, therefore may, maybe more easily hydrogenated. Alternative explanation. Okay. But considering you might be moving some metals around, so you can't bridge bond quite as easily as you would without the, uh, both the CO and the hydrogen present. Thank you for the suggestion. Any other question?